debating society of its kind in St Andrews, or indeed anywhere else for, for that matter. Uh, I didn't have, we're, we're over dinner, we're discussing some of the, uh, our, our greatest hits, Tony and I at the university, and I attended the uh, Stirling University, which um, did not sadly have a, a debating society of this kind, but nevertheless we, we made the best that we, we, we could of that. But uh, when I was at the university, it was at the tail end of the government of John Major, and it seemed to myself and my colleagues who were involved in student politics and party politics at that time that a more useless, disreputable, and in some cases uh, incompetent government would be impossible to find than the one that we had at that point in time. And yet, here we are. And if history is now kind to the administration that, that John Major led, I think it is in large part due to the, the actions in office of three individuals in particular, David Cameron, Theresa May, and Boris Alexander the Fethel Johnson. Each of them is thoroughly deserving, I believe, of the accolade of being the worst Prime Minister that the United Kingdom has ever had, except for the previous one. Now, each could uh, detain us for more than the 11 minutes that we have on their own. However, for I think, sheer incompetence, mendacity, and the rewarding of loyalty over genuine talent and outright harm's cause, I have no hesitation in saying that the present government Majesty's is the worst in the, the worst in living memory. And I think in order to make my case, I don't want I, I only need to go back over the last two and a half weeks since Parliament has returned from its summer recess. Now to look at what has been done. The government has confirmed that plans to proceed with a cut to universal credit, to removing the £20 a week uplift that was put in place to help families through the pandemic. Now, £20 might not sound like a lot, but for many of the families who were most in need of that, it was uh, something which genuinely kept the, the wolf from the door. And the idea that we, we might be taking this away from them now seems to me to be utterly explicable. It's a move which will result in uh, one third of families with children in Scotland losing over £1,000 a year overnight, and it will plunge 20,000 children into poverty. We're going to see very shortly the removal of the furlough scheme. Uh, that's a scheme which did not help those uh, who were directors of small companies who were remunerated through dividends on, on their activities. Many people have been left without any meaningful financial support throughout the pandemic in that category. But to remove the furlough, even in sectors where there are still issues there, seems to me to be removed, kicking the legs out from under the recovery, however tentative it is. The government has also confirmed in the past week that it intends to remove the statutory entitlement of pensioners to have their pensions rise in line with earnings. We've also seen the health and social care levy be announced, uh, reaching a, a manifesto promise of the Conservative Party uh, not to put an increase on uh, national insurance. But while the crisis in health and social care, particularly in England, is certainly not something that I would uh, question the need to do something about, um, the difficulty, one of many difficulties that I and others have is, is that the government intends to raise about £11.4 billion through this tax with absolutely no plan of how it intends to use it either in the NHS or indeed to tackle the social care <coughs> crisis. And most despicable of all, it is a burden which is going to have its greatest impact on the lowest paid and those who have least in the way of assets. And there, I think, we get to the nub of much of the problem here. We have a UK government which talks the language of levelling up, all the while it is punching down, and those who have the least, entrenching economic, social, and geographical and generational inequalities for generations to come in the process. And one of the, the most startling statistics out of that, particularly in terms of how this affects intergenerational solidarity, is that with this levy, if anyone is graduating who has had to pay student fees, they are facing, when they go into employment, a marginal rate of tax of nearly 50% of their earnings, just as they're about to embark on the journey of life. That is the reality of what this government is doing. Moving on from that, we're all familiar with the shenanigans that there has been around Brexit, but uh, we're also now seeing a kicking of the can down the road in terms of the UK imposing the, uh, the terms of withdrawal agreement, which
chips went into, into freely with our European partners. Particularly that affects the Northern Ireland Protocol and the impact has been a very, very serious impact indeed on the availability of products. It's causing mayhem in politics over there, as anyone who's been paying attention will have, will have seen. But instead of being in a position to implement those agreements which the UK government entered into freely, it is instead kicking the can down the road to the end of the year where we presumably we go through an exercise like this all over again. If this has provoked a threat to collapse devolution in Northern Ireland. It's also led in its own way to seeing the publication of a poll last week showing that in Scotland, 51% of Scots would now vote for independence given the choice. Now, all of this has come from the leader of Her Majesty's Government. It has happened at his hand on his watch. The First Lord of the Treasury and up until his reshuffle, the self-appointed Minister for the Union who decided to sack himself from that role. And I really wonder whether or not it is any wonder that he chose to do so. <coughs> but that brings me to the greatest failure, I believe, of this uh, Her Majesty's Government and why we should indeed have no confidence in it. It is a complete failure of statecraft that there was over Brexit, which again transcends those three Prime Ministers I mentioned at the start, David Cameron, <coughs> Theresa May, and <coughs> Boris Johnson himself. They have taken uh, an alliance which has worked well for us over the last 40 years and ripped it up without giving us anything better in the process. They performed a power grab on the devolution settlement, which has uh, embedded itself and shown its worth over the, the decades in which it has been in place. They've taken a fragile but established and settled peace process in Northern Ireland and have instead laid a border down the Irish Sea, reactivating meant much of the symbolism which the Good Friday Agreement was able to, to put to, to, to rest leaving many Northern Irish Unionists in cold fury at the actions he's taken there. And all of that was done under the slogan of Get Brexit Done, that reductive slogan. Um, it might have said, the Prime Minister might have said, except for viewers in Northern Ireland, because I think that it's, it's worth dwelling <coughs> on this, because not only did Boris Johnson undermine to his predecessor Theresa May in order to get the top job in Banjax, the idea of the backstop, which might not that some of the problems we're now seeing. But when he said get Brexit done, he meant getting Brexit done only for Great Britain. And Northern Ireland was almost some kind of afterthought uh, to be dealt with after the event. That's not the only, uh, that's not the only betrayal here. He's betrayed the fishing industry, arguably the sector of the economy. I know representing a constituency in the northeast of Scotland how hard he and his party extolled the virtues of what Brexit would bring for the fishing industry and it has left them with absolutely nothing of what was promised. We are seeing a betrayal of the farming industry, we are seeing our country <coughs> being left short of labour in the key sectors, not just in uh, agriculture and seafood, but also particularly in terms of the haulage industry. We are seeing extreme shortages there as people who previously came from the European Union to work here vote with their feet, deciding that they are no longer welcome and that frankly they would be better somewhere else. He has presided over our friends and neighbours from the EU viewing us as an unreliable partner whose word no longer means anything when it is said. And above all, and coming back to this point about the generational uh, differences, he has deprived you, every single person in this room, of the right to live, work, love and travel entirely freely in 27 European Union member states to treat them as if they were your own state. And on top of that, passing an election bill which requires people to produce identification to vote, trying to solve a vote of ID fraud problem which does not exist, purely to disenfranchise those who are least likely in the shows to vote for he and his party. Now, I will draw my remarks to a close very shortly, but I can't help but think back to that time when I was a student. John Major gave an interview in front of a microphone which he thought was not mine, but it was to Michael Brunson, ITN's political editor at the time. And he referred to his cabinet bastards, the Eurosceptics that were there, aided and abetted by Ian Duncan Smith, and the Bill Cashes. At Westminster, they have won. The new Red Wall Conservative MPs have come in, are their political children. 
they now represent the mainstream. And it's hard, I think, for me to understand how we have managed to get from that situation in the early 19... Those red wall Tories and others may have confidence in Her Majesty's Government. Their jobs depend on them having confidence in Her Majesty's Government. But I certainly don't have confidence in Her Majesty's Government. And there's absolutely no reason why anyone else in this room, I put it to you, should have confidence in Her Majesty's Government either. Thank you. Thank you to you tonight. I very much appreciate uh, your invitation to speak in front of the live, live audience of the brightest and best that the university has to offer. I've listened with interest to uh, my colleague's uh, position. Uh, the motion tonight, the House has no faith in the Majesty's Government, I find a bit odd because uh, faith means unquestioning confidence and no voter should ever completely trust its government. Uh, unless, of course, you're in the SNP, where absolute loyalty is demanded and usually given regardless of performance. But I'll come back to that. Now, in order to determine this motion, you'll have to decide whether the Westminster government is, as I believe, doing a good job for Scotland under exceptionally difficult circumstances, or whether there's a better alternative, whether Labour could do better, or indeed whether the SNP <coughs> could do better running an independent Scotland. Because I contend that you can't decide for this motion unless you can see a viable alternative that is likely to do better. So let me quickly deal with Labour and Westminster option. Labour, I believe, are in terrible decline. People don't know what they stand for, and their flip-flopping over Brexit was frankly ridiculous. The Corbyn, pseudo-Marxist years have left them unelectable, at least for the time being. And Keith Starmer has got a long and winding road ahead of him to reconnect with his core vote. And in Scotland, they are paying the price of decades of lazy complacency. They took the voter for granted and are now paying the price. Now, my party, the Conservatives, have been in government at Westminster since 2010, coming in, some of you may remember, only just, on the back of the financial meltdown of 2008. We offer three key principles. Keep the nation safe and secure from terrorist and state threat, including the nuclear threat. Live within our means, a concept that Labour has never managed to grasp. Somebody has to earn the money that is spent by government. Nothing is free. And finally, have as small a government as possible. The way to afford adequate pensions, benefits and public services is to free people and business to learn innovate and thrive. Ambition is what drives a successful economy, not the dead hand of state control. So what is the HM government's record? Well, we got Brexit done. And I hear all my colleagues have said, but done means it's done. That was four years ago. And after seemingly endless political deadlock and near paralysis of the state, Boris got it over the line. And it doesn't really matter, ladies and gentlemen, what your personal views were or are about the decision to leave the EU. I was a Remainer. But it's done, and anyone who respects democracy will accept that it's done. There's a fundamental co uh, commitment implicit in a referendum. The government says this is too important. We'll put the issue directly to the people, and whatever the outcome, we will implement it. No buts, no maybes, no repeats, no let's try again until we get a different answer. And the same applies to the 2014 Scottish Independence referendum. The party opposite me chose the question in 2014, they chose the electorate, they chose the timing, they had all the advantage, and they lost. <coughs> the Scottish people didn't believe the honeyed words of obscure promises, and they voted decisively to remain part of the 300 year success story that is the United Kingdom. And frankly, hell mend you for trying to unpick that decision. <coughs> you claim that it's Brexit that gives you the right to do it again, to go again. But you know that the campaign for a second referendum started the day after the result of the first was known. It has little to do with the EU, they've simply been looking for an excuse peg to hang it on. So Brexit done. What else? Well, pre-COVID, Her <coughs> Majesty's Government was getting control of the massive budget deficit, bequeathed by Labour. It introduced universal credit to create a fair, affordable, simplified and sustainable benefit system. 
It had already introduced the triple lock system for state pensions to bring the value of those pensions back to where they should be. A massive commitment. And COVID, of course, has been the challenge of the century so far. And Her Majesty's Government negotiated its way through the mayhem, fear and uncertainty of the last 18 months better than most. It spent an estimated £23 billion to support Scotland through the pandemic, protecting nearly a million jobs through the furlough system and the job retention bonus, and ensuring that we had an economy to come back to. All delivered on the back of the broad financial shoulders of the UK, the fifth largest economy in the world, its fiscal strength and long-standing reputation in the money markets. And as we speak, we are vaccinating nearly everyone in the country that needs it. That is an also an outstanding achievement in the fight to survive this virus, and amongst the best performers in the world. The government innovated, invested and procured well ahead of the game, saving lives and protecting the well-being of the population. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the performance of an incompetent government. Who else would have done better? And how? Well, according to Ms Sturgeon, you'll get the chance to find out in 2023, when she holds another referendum. That's a referendum she doesn't have the devolved power to hold, by the way, but she likes to keep the grievance pot in Sydney. Now here's a few facts about this option of an independent Scotland, and I mean facts, because I'm quoting from the Scottish Government's own statistics. On day one of an independent Scotland, £12 billion will be removed from the budget. That's the union dividend provided by Westminster to fill the gap between what Scotland spends on its public services and what it collects in revenue. £12 billion. That's equivalent to the entire annual budget of the Scottish NHS. And it's not a flash in the pan. It's been more than £10 billion per year for the last six years. An independent Scotland would have to slash spending, raise taxes, already the highest taxes in the UK by the way, or borrow to maintain, never mind cut, the budget deficit. The effect on public services would be catastrophic. But I'll acknowledge it's not enough to persuade Scots to remain in Great Britain just by firing dire economic predictions at them. Those who voted in the EU referendum voted not with their wallets, but with their hearts as a matter of instinctual gut feeling. And it might be the same with the Scots if the barrage of propaganda they're getting wears them down. But this House, when making its decision tonight, might like to ponder on some of these puzzles. Why do the SNP think they'll be able to continue to use sterling, even for a while? What happens to the idea of living off oil wells when we're already abandoning fossil fuels? How will they raise and afford their own intelligence capability and defence forces? What happens to the 30,000 UK defence jobs in Scotland? Why do they think they'll be able to join the EU when this will almost certainly be vetoed by Spain and France that really doesn't like the Anglophile ascendancy? Oh, and Scotland's budget deficit is four times bigger than the maximum allowed for entry. Do they understand that accession will take years to which they won't have a currency, let alone <coughs> any subsidies? Why do they want to join the euro when it's a, a manifest failure? Why do they think an interest rate fixed for a European average would fit Scotland? How does it make sense to throw off London, where they have parliamentary representatives with real clout, in favour of a European Parliament of 27 nations which has no power whatsoever. How will a hard border with England or with tariffs be managed? And what happens to the Scots, like me, who don't want to give up their British passports? Will their nationality be changed by force majeure? And finally, let's take a look at what the First Minister is prioritising, along with her Green partners in her programme for government. With a massive budget deficit, Scotland topped the European charts for COVID infection and people dying in ambulances, and the armed forces called in to help me here today. What's on our agenda? Is it economic recovery? Is it uh, growth, health and social care? Well, it can't be growth because the Greens are against growth. But right up there on the SNP agenda are the pressing issues of giving pardons for offences committed in the minor strike 50 years ago, more control of fox hunting, and wait for it, quickie gender swaps. It's virtue signalling at its worst. And of course, the inevitable, unjustified and grindingly divisive second independence referendum. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, this House will not find it difficult to criticise Her Majesty's Government for its mistakes and compromises 
as it wrestles with the realities of a post-COVID world, with an environmental crisis already upon us, and hostile resurgent nuclear-armed dictatorships and terrorist threats ever present. We don't know if Western economies are going to bounce back, and the pandemic is not over. But if we are to have a level of faith in a government going forward, then it should be placed firmly with the tried and tested UK government in Westminster, and not with the anglophone nationalists peddling fantasy economics and a deeply flawed obsessive vision that would lead Scotland to <coughs> rancour and ruin. It's that to save lives or protect the economy or do whatever it is you're talking about, you actually have to intervene and you can't really just have innovation and leave everything free floating around, right? You can't eat out to help out, you can't do any of that because what happens is you kill people and the thing about dead people, right, so they find it really difficult to go to work and like make money and then spend it or like have ideas or you know innovate or whatever it is that we think happens to protect the economy and make that really good and so that's kind of maybe something that's important to think about when we think about whether small government or conservative values actually saved lives or protected anyone in this pandemic or indeed protected the economy which is what they want to say they're doing but the thing about financial crashes as well because the speaker touched on that is you know, financial crashes aren't necessarily particularly caused by the government. What they were caused by was mortgage lenders and banks and people who hand out money, handing out money at massive amounts of risk because they wanted people to innovate and they didn't want to regulate too much and they thought that was a good way to make revenue. And that sounds a little bit like small government to me. And so it's almost as if to protect people, to save lives, to protect the economy, you have to regulate things and you have to intervene and you have to do things that help people and so personally when I think about the government and my opinion on it I think that probably if you're going to lean left wing or at the very least lean not conservative values small government that's probably a better thing for the economy and it's probably a better thing for people's lives as well and maybe just to conclude I think this is fantastic evidence that bacon sandwiches were in fact terrible for the country because listen, I can totally see that people have their criticisms of Jeremy Corbyn and I can totally see that people have their criticisms of Keir Starmer but maybe Ed Miliband was actually kind of alright and maybe he wouldn't have like taken us out of the European Union or like killed a ton of people and I just want to leave that thought in everyone's head of oh, how to propose. The way in which you have to adjudicate this debate, because I'm a competitive debater, that sounds like I'm doing it anyway, I think the way in which you have to think about this debate is conceptualising what faith in a government means to you. And I think what that means is what is the most important aspect of a government for you. I think we've heard a lot about ideology, but I think the most important point that transcends this is the metric of democracy. Whether you believe the government that is in place has protection of democracy to allow you the access to change the government if you do see fit. Like, we have heard from proposition that the one thing in which government, this government may be doing to change that is things like voter ID suppression and things like that. But I want to propose three things that probably mean that you should side with opposition. Firstly, I think this has to do with what we've heard about Brexit, the idea of carrying through a democratic mandate that the opposition and comparative parties would not do. I think if you believe in the idea of democratic accountability and things like that, you have to side with opposition. Secondly, I think the notion that in the first time in 11 years, we actually have a majority government which allows people to dissent from government power. I think this is one of the key mechanisms that requires democracy, because I don't think democracies actually work if you have minority governments. And thirdly, I think it's the overhaul of Whitehall systems that we are seeing uniquely under undertaking in the administration. Maybe the Boris Johnson isn't doing this and there's other eight figures that have done it, but I think the idea that we are changing and making more accountable the mechanisms of Whitehall is a reason to believe that we're actually bringing more democracy back to our government. And for those reasons, I think you should have done I think I'm going to make this very briefly, but I think that's just an important consideration as governments become more personal and become more able to identify with and think about those who are representing us and those who are kind of leading the, the country, I think it's important to consider the personal aspect of the failures of the government this, this kind of past pandemic. Um, particularly in the fact that like the policies proposed, no matter their merits or like cons, uh, weren't followed by the governments themselves and that kind of has sort of two main impacts. The first of which is uh, the ability to like believe in them being possible to follow. Like if the government who have created these laws don't follow them themselves, then it kind of implies that it's either like they think they're better than us or um, the laws themselves are impossible to follow. And I think the second of which is this idea of like us and them. Like it makes it seem as though the government that's representing us 
uh, is not one of us. And I think that that's something that should be like held fast and enshrined in our own kind of like politics and government relationship is that you know the reason that we have a parliament is that we have people who are the same as us in government. And I think the government itself has not kind of upheld that value, which is why I urge you to propose a motion. As has been said, it's slightly a weird wording because nobody should have complete faith in the government. However, this conservative government that we have fails at time after time, and I personally believe that nobody should have faith in this government at all. And this is for two main reasons. One, the absolute travesty that was students and the coronavirus pandemic, and the second is LGBT rights in the UK. So first of all, the coronavirus pandemic was a terrible time for all of us, but for students particularly, it has and it is still affecting us. We can see it now. There is hardly anybody standing, hardly anybody sitting in this hall. And that is because the rules around coronavirus are so confusing and so convoluted that it is meaning our experiences as young people in an institute of learning are being damaged. Also, the vaccine rate of students is disastrously low. And that is because it is incredibly difficult for students to get vaccinated. So as somebody who should have been vaccinated with the most vulnerable group, who should have been vaccinated in March, I was not allowed to get the vaccine because I was not living in my student hall of residence. This meant I had to personally take on the NHS to get a vaccine I had a legal right to get. And this has happened to many people. There are many people in this room who got the vaccine after they were supposed to because the government did not take into account that students live in multiple places at once. Now, this wasn't so bad for me because I lived in the same council area, but for people who study in Scotland, trying to get a vaccine in England or in Wales or in Northern Ireland was extremely difficult. And this is purely because the government could not take into account we are the silent group of people who are harmed by this pandemic. And we are still being harmed with the confusing rules, the absolute atrocious discipline that is being forced at a university level which doesn't make sense because the university is ultimately not legal upholders. The university should not be pushing these rules, but they are because there are no legal mandates in place to fix that. Second of all, the LGBT rights in the UK are horrifying. So we have seen recently the government say that they are going to ban conversion therapy. Now, this is after countless protests and petitions because why is conversion therapy even legal in the first place? It is a horrifying, torturous process that many <coughs> LGBT youths undergo and LGBT adults undergo that is horrifying and only leads to damage. But the conservative government did not want to fix this because they thought they might be intruding on religious freedoms. Now, why the government is thinking it is okay to allow torture in this country when they say they stand against terrorism, they stand against abuse, but they let Poor LGBT youth suffer every single day is not right, and therefore I have no faith in Her Majesty's government and I am so proud to propose. Thank you. Um, so I would like to start off that well, I'm Scottish, I'm from Fife, and I'm proud to say that. And I cannot see how I can have faith in an SNP government at the moment. Because I've come up in a system where I spent seven years at high school where they didn't have funding to fix the hole in the roof in the music department. We had a bin bag that was down into a bucket. They didn't have money to pay for jobbers. And they proposed that we leave um, the United Kingdom and that we will be independent. And I can't frankly see how that can be afforded because we can't afford to fix a roof in a school under current situations. I don't feel like the SNP, a government, the Scottish government, has looked after education in that sense. I will, however, credit them for providing our tuition for university. My other concern is that they, our alternative to Her Majesty's government just now is to move to SNP, potentially. We have Labour as well. But what is SNP's motives? They say a referendum. How is another referendum going to fix our problems? I don't know if any of you were in Scotland when we had our last referendum, but it divided the country more than ever. We couldn't discuss it at family events, I couldn't discuss it with our friends because it was the most heated discussions I've ever had. It divided us so deeply and at this moment I do not feel like that is what the country needs. We are recovering from a very difficult situation of Covid 
And to move on, how is dividing the country further on another very sensitive issue going to solve the issues we face today? So I proudly oppose this motion and I would like people to consider some of the points I've raised today. So remind people about the nature of this debate. Uh, the, the motion is this house has no faith in this majesty's government and your faith in the, the SNP or Labour or whatever to, to lead the country is irrelevant. It's not about how good they are relative to the Conservatives. It's about how good the current government is. And it's entirely possible to have faith, to not have faith in the current, current government or faith in any of the alternatives. And I think that's been totally missed. So I oppose the motion. No proposal. Sorry. <laughs> see how much I've enjoyed this debate and the, the contributions that we've had from the floor. There have been some very interesting uh, contributions and some angles that I haven't thought of uh, in terms of how I was looking to formulate my own contribution this evening. There have been contributions that I have uh, agreed with manifestly and there have been contributions that I've disagreed with and there are contributions that I've disagreed with that actually in some respects have had elements of fairness in in the charge. And I think that gets to, as, as a number of speakers from the floor have said, that uh, it's impossible to have absolute faith in any government, but that doesn't mean that your faith or otherwise in Her Majesty's government is necessarily governed by your faith in what some of the alternatives might be. This is a judgment about one, uh, what, one government that would be invited to take, and the judgment I would invite each of you to take is that we cannot have confidence in that. I wasn't, uh, in, in, in my opponent's uh, contribution, I, I'm not surprised that they spend more time criticising uh, the Scottish National Party than defending the, the UK government, but there is one thing that I will take issue with him on, and I thought I heard him say it, and I saw it written down in his notes, but he made an accusation of the SNP being anglophobic. Now, I think that's a particularly maladroit accusation to make, given the SNP's impeccable civic nationalism, and particularly so just a matter of days after an MSP from the Conservative Party was forced to apologise on the floor of the Scottish Parliament for making a similar accusation. So I think that was a, an argument that uh, detracted from the overall argument that was made. I think it's demeaning to the argument and demeaning to the individual who made it, and I hope that summing up, Tony might wish to reflect on that and withdraw that. So, as I say, we are right not to have absolute faith in any government, but Democracy is inherently a, a divisive thing. You're asking people to make choices. You're asking people to make choices between who benefits, who doesn't, who pays more in tax, who pays less in tax, where scarce resources are allocated. As Vladimir Lenin said, politics is about who does what to whom. Politics is the way that we resolve that in a peaceful, civilised manner. We've heard talk about uh, independence tonight. I actually thought going into the election when I was elected that we should have two referendums. Uh, one on Brexit, because we seem to have drifted so far from the vision that was originally painted that people deserve the right to go back and be asked, are you sure? But also, in light of all that we've experienced since 2014, to revisit that decision <coughs> of Scottish independence, because, quite simply, the union that we were asked to endorse in 2014 no longer exists in the same form. And that was the thing. There were many, many people who voted to be in two unions in 2014, who now, through no wish of their own, find that they will have to choose one or the other. And I think that the only way that we resolve this is in having the case any kind of civilised debate that we had in 2014, which I appreciate was not everyone's experience, but I believe it was the experience of the majority in terms of how we wrestle with these big issues and resolve that tension once and for all. But I don't intend to go back over old ground in my opening remarks. As I say, I think in order to set out my case, I have relied on the actions of Her Majesty's Government over the last two and a half weeks. I just hope that we don't have to put up with their antics for the next two and a half years as well, if that's the direction in which they are choosing to go. Thank you all very much. If I may, just uh, picking up from the comments from the floor, from the last speaker, um, it would have been a pretty dull debate if we, just, if we hadn't uh, gone to what I got into, uh, to take that into account. But I do believe, actually, while in theory I believe you're right, yeah, sorry, in theory you're right, uh, in practice, you just can't say that government's useless. You have to, in the real world, choose an alternative. There has to be somebody out there who will deliver something better and have the evidence and the policies that they will be able to do something better than the current one. Otherwise, our democracy goes down a stank. Uh, 
Why are we, the, the idea that the government's performance uh, in COVID didn't save lives? I'll say two things about that. Firstly, I think, regardless of party politics, it was ridiculous throughout the COVID <coughs> pandemic that we had four separate approaches from four separate decision-making bodies, Scotland, England, Ireland, and Wales, trying to pass legislation which was broadly similar, if not identical, but different in minor ways and timings and scales, and it was hopelessly confusing. People could not work out, literally couldn't work out, it would be difficult, they just couldn't understand what they were and were not allowed to do. And now that it was a case of a unified approach on asylum, um, that was it. And the other is that the, you save lives in this pandemic, you save lives, and we are the first out, uh, out of this, or to where the new stability will be, because of the vaccines. Vaccination is the world priority. We are getting there first. That was the key achievement of the government. The mayhem, the uncertainty, the missed calls, the, you know, I would level that at virtually everybody uh, because nobody had done it before. And the medical advice and the scientific advice was developing and at the same time the politicians were thinking how do we keep this country alive and how do we uh, make sure we've got an economy to come, to come back to because this will end. But that's not worth a life. So how do I square that in something? Difficult. Does the um, government have the democratic protection? Uh, critical, absolutely fundamental. I cannot emphasise enough. If you keep trying to run a, a government on repeated referendums, we voted for that, and actually things have changed a year or two later, so we'd like to hold it again and see what happens. Can you imagine what would happen if we ran it again? And the division and rancour, and I very much pick up from uh, the, the, our fellow Pfeiffer, <coughs> one of them, don't you, you know what I mean. Uh, that the rancor and division, the argument in 2014, was appalling. I, I really don't believe you said that. It was appalling. There was abuse on the streets, personal friendships, families broken up, and we're still arguing about it years later. And it's still being pushed, despite the decision, quite clearly and decisively, back in 2014. Once in a generation. That doesn't mean when something comes along and you can change it. And I'd also say, that after 14 years of power, which the SNP have had, 14 years of power, it's not just fixing school roofs. They ought to have a litany, they ought to have a list, a, a mile long of their achievements of what they've done for this country. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. They're so focused on independence. Now, I'm not going to stand here trying to defend Boris. Uh, Boris is a particular individual and uh, he does what he does. But he's our Prime Minister and he's got the de democratic mandate. And it would be absolutely wrong of you to think, because I don't like Boris, uh, we don't have any faith in this government. Why would you have faith in the government? Okay, some of you have made your minds up, but for those who are still thinking about this, what is it that in this chaotic last two and a half years, they closed the budget deficit, which is critical, you've got to have enough money to spend on your public services. They've delivered on the, 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 the referendum, that was uh, passed legally and, and with complete and open democratic process, and they're delivering on it. What else could they do? And they've got us through the, the, the COVID pandemic to the point where we're, where we're amongst the world's top five, top three in our vaccination rates. That is what you'd expect from a government of the day, and that is what they have done. And regardless of, of anything else, the evidence here does not suggest that there's anybody else in Westminster or any other democratic model that would do better. So I, with great enthusiasm, ask you to reject this motion. Thank you. Uh, and the reason I use it is because there is a steady stream, a theme, throughout, maybe not the official uh, policy and doctrine uh, of the SNP, certainly amongst the supporters, certainly in, uh, in an extreme way uh, amongst a uh, percentage of the SNP supporters, the uh, photographs of uh, people painted in Braveheart outfits, it wasn't a democracy, by the, uh, it wasn't a documentary by the way, uh, people in Braveheart outfits telling that Scotland was closed, telling that the English can F off. Uh, that theme, there's no point in denying it, it exists, it's alive and well in your party and you know it. It may not be an official policy, but isn't it quite useful to have that theme? Because all nationalism works on blaming the other. There has to be somebody to blame for the grievance. There has to be somebody to hold to account, to always be complaining about. Always be complaining about. There's a history in nationalism 
of blaming the other for their sins and mythologizing it. And you know who I'm talking about. That process, that theme is alive and well. The SNP deliberately hierarchy deliberately do not support uh, formally that process. They've never admit to it. Uh, it may, and it's probably untrue in certain areas. But a large section of the SNP do. And you've only got to go out there and talk to voters who come from England and ask them if they've ever had the uh, anti-English bile thrown up by SNP supporters, and you'll get evidence in spades. So, I come to the point where I will retract it in the context of saying that the SNP are formally anglophobic. What I should have said is that there's a strong anglophobic theme amongst SNP supporters, and for that I will not apologise. We had one word in the speech, and we've had a great many extra words added, which I don't think have uh, added anything to the debate. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that you didn't feel able to retract that with more grace, Tony. I think it finishes what should have been a, if not a joyful occasion, being back together debating. It certainly leaves it on a, a, something of a sour note because I think that the, there are many examples of parties which are xenophobic, which seek to exploit fear of the other. The SNP is certainly not one of them, and it has a record which is absolutely impeccable in that regard. And I'm sorry that you refused to have grace to even acknowledge the situation. In, but there are many people who have chosen to come to Scotland to make their lives and the view of my party list to be any doubt in it is that anyone who comes to live Scotland who chooses to make their lives here is very, very welcome. And that is one of the reasons why Brexit grates so hard and why we feel we have lost so much wrong. So I will leave to, uh, Tony to stew in his uh, sense of indignation about that. I am confident that the record that my party has shown in terms of achieving government and within government. It may not be to the record, may not be to everyone's liking in all aspects, but certainly in terms of the welcome that it gives to all who choose to come here is absolutely un is absolutely un